Madam President. The Senator from Washington. Thank you, Madam President. We are nearing the end of what has been a long, winding, and tough process. And I just want to start by thanking everyone who has worth, worked with me to get here. And that starts, of course, with my Vice Chair, Senator Collins, who has been a really great partner throughout this process, and I so appreciate it. I also want to thank our counterparts in the House, Chair Granger and Ranking Member DeLauro. And I want to thank all of my staff and the Vice Chairs who have worked tirelessly on these bills. All our incredible subcommittee chairs, Senators Tester, Van Hollen, Murphy, Baldwin, Reed, and Coons. Our ranking members, Senators Haggerty, Britt, Capito, Fisher, and Graham. Leaders Schumer and McConnell, and all of their staffs, and so many others. As I've said before, this is not the package I would have written all on my own, but by working together, we were finally able to hammer out an agreement on funding bills that protect and even strengthen critical investments in our families, in our economy, and in our national security. Make no mistake, we had to work under very difficult top-line numbers and fight off literally hundreds of extreme Republican poison pills from the House, not to mention some unthinkable cuts. But at the end of the day, this is a bill that will keep our country and our families moving forward. So I want to talk about what is in this package before our final vote. And I want to start with something that is a top priority for families and for me, childcare, which is far out of reach for so many people right now. I will seize every opportunity I can to help families get a affordable childcare. And in this funding bill, I'm pleased to say that we increased federal funding for childcare and pre-K by a billion dollars. And that is not even counting steps I secured to protect the C campus program that helps young parents who are in college who need childcare, or double the capacity for the universal pre-K program we have for our service members. Ultimately, we need to pass, I believe, my Child Care for Working Families Act to fix this crisis and make affordable child care a real reality for every family. But until we get there, I will keep pushing for every inch of progress to alleviate the stress families are feeling when it comes to child care. Can we take steps to help our military families get child care? What about moms who are looking to get a college degree? What about a bit of progress can we make to help folks? These are the questions that motivate my thinking on this issue and many others, like people's health and well-being. This package provides crucial health funding. It boosts research funding for cancer, for Alzheimer's, for maternal mortality, and more. It funds community health centers, local efforts to fight the opioid and mental health crisis, and the new Federal Office of P Pandemic Preparedness that I created with former Senator Burr. In the face of House Republicans' push to gut funding to end HIV and build our public health infrastructure, we protected those vital efforts in this bill. And we protected family planning, not just from the House Republican efforts to defund Title X entirely, but also from countless far-right proposals to restrict women's reproductive freedom. The American people should know that Democrats stood firm to reject every single one of those. And we also stood together to make critical investments in education, protecting increase, increases we made to the maximum Pell Award in recent years, educator preparation initiatives, and workforce training programs. And we rejected House Republicans' unthinkable cuts in funding for K-12 schools, which would have reduced funding for nearly 90% of school districts and forced teachers out of our kids' classrooms. And of course, this package does fund our staffs and Capitol Police here in Congress, our election security, and other essential basic functions of government. And there, then there are the crucial investments for our national security. Madam President, at a time when Putin is on the march in Ukraine, the Chinese government is growing its influence in an aggressive posture, and the Israel-Hamas war is still raging, American leadership could not be more essential. That's, a, that's why it remains imperative 
the Speaker finally put that national security supplemental bill that we passed overwhelmingly up for a vote. And it is why this bill also includes investments to promote global stability, to keep our country safe, to deter conflict, and ensure our military remains the strongest in the world. That means investments in diplomacy, maintaining strong ties with our allies, upholding our commitments, forging new partnerships, providing more humanitarian aid, and promoting stability and global health. It means investments in defense, and not just funds for new equipment, though that is important, but investments in the men and women in uniform who are our true front lines of defense. The bill provides our service members a pay raise. It invests in child care for their kids, like I mentioned earlier. It invests in food security and strengthens our efforts to prevent suicide and address sexual assault and harassment in the forces and more. And this bill secured additional visas for brave Afghans who worked alongside our service members during the war in Afghanistan. Finally, this package provides critical operational funding for the Department of Homeland Security. It is certainly not a perfect outcome, but let's not forget that Democrats were at the table. We were ready to pass a bipartisan border policy deal until Donald Trump told Republicans to kill that deal. But, Madam President, in spite of that, the funding in this bill shows we can at least agree to some extent that we must not shortchange crucial work stopping fentanyl from reaching our communities, stopping dangerous human trafficking, cracking down on drug cartels, and ensuring our borders are operating safely, efficiently, and humanely. Now, Madam President, I hope my colleagues will work with me to close the book on FY24, to avoid a shutdown, and get this bill passed ASAP. And then let's make sure we all learn from the hard lessons of the past few months about how we do get things done in a divided government. Because what we have seen at every stage of this process is when we do work together, when we put our heads down and focus on solutions and listen to our constituents, we can find common ground. We can craft bipartisan bills. But when House Republicans stopped everything to renegotiate the deal they struck with the president, when they insisted on partisan poison bills, when they listened to the loudest voices on the far right, who, let's be real, were never going to vote for any bipartisan funding bill, that gets us nowhere. It wasted months of precious time, far better spent crafting bills that grow our economy and protect our country and make things better for folks back home. And after all of that delay, how different ultimately was the outcome? Think about that. And yet now we are here, six months into the fiscal year, and agencies will just have six months le left to leverage these full year spending bills. Madam President, I believe that we negotiated strong bipartisan bills that will help the American people. And this outcome is so much better than a shutdown or a full year CR, which would have had devastating cuts. But it should never have taken us this long to get here. We should not teeter on the verge of a shutdown and lurch from one CR to another. Agencies should not be dedicating so many resources to preparing, for, preparing again and again for a possible government shutdown. Don't we all agree that the Pentagon and NIH have better ways to be spending their time and their tax dollars? The far-right elements who force this dysfunction claim to care a lot about fiscal responsibility, but the constant chaos that they create is the opposite of fiscal responsibility. The truth is, these appropriation bills are written over the course of months after dozens of hearings with the input from nearly every member and they reflect the priorities of every state in America. Working together, focusing on solutions, solving problems for people back home, that is the responsible way to get things done. And it is, for the most part, how we conducted ourselves here in the Senate. Vice Chair Collins and I held bipartisan hearings. We gave every senator an opportunity to weigh in on these bills. And we crafted 12 bills that passed out of our committee overwhelmingly, many unanimously. 
And I think we need more of that as we begin our work now on FY25 if we're going to keep this process on track. So, Madam President, as we finally pass this bill, I urge all of my colleagues to really take the lessons of the past year to heart. Congress can still work, but only when we come to the negotiating table in good faith and leave politics at the door. Now, before I turn it over, I want to submit into the record a list recognizing our incredibly dedicated staff, the people who truly keep the trains on track, and who poured so many long days and nights of hard work into these bills. I ask unanimous consent to include that in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. And I again want to thank my colleague who has worked with me side by side through ups and downs and challenges for well over a year now to get us where, to where we are today. And we want to get this bill passed and move on because we believe that by working together, we make America better. Thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Maine. Madam President, I rise today in support of the final six government funding bills before us. These bipartisan, bicameral bills are the results of many months of hard work by the appropriations committees in both the Senate and the House. Let me start by thanking Chair Murray for her tremendous leadership and hard work throughout the entire appropriations process. She has really made a difference. Since Chair Murray and I took the helm of the committee over a year ago, we have been committed to an appropriations process that provided senators with a voice in funding decisions through robust committee proceedings. Toward that end, we held more than 50 public hearings and briefings. We televised our committee markups for the first time ever, and the Senate Appropriations Committee marked up and advanced all 12 bills individually for the first time in five years. And we did so with overwhelming bipartisan support. Every single bill, each and every one of them, was subject to robust debate and amendments. Many of them passed unanimously, I am pleased to say others with only one dissenting vote. This final package on the Senate floor today includes the fiscal year 2024 appropriations bills for the Department of Defense, state and foreign operations, financial services and general government, labor, health and human services and education, the legislative branch, and Homeland Security. Madam President, we are not punting through yet another continuing resolution, nor is this an omnibus. Rather, it is a package of six individual bills that fund critical programs, important agencies, and essential departments through the end of this fiscal year. Now, Madam President, I would have preferred that more of these bills have been brought across the Senate floor, but no one can say that they were not available for scrutiny since we reported the last of them from committee way back in July. I want to, in addition to my thanks of course, Chair Murray, to thank the ranking Republican members on each of the subcommittees reflected in the package today. Senators Graham, Haggerty, Capito, Fisher, and Britt for their outstanding efforts in assembling this package. And I also want to acknowledge the contributions of their Democratic chairs. 
Madam President, this legislation is truly a national security bill. 70% of the funding in this package is for our national defense, including investments that strengthen our military readiness and industrial base, provide pay and benefit increases for our brave service members, and support our closest allies. This legislation also supports America's working families while providing funding to better secure our borders and combat the transnational criminal organizations that are flooding our communities with fentanyl. As part of the effort to address the crisis at the border, and it is a crisis, this package includes funding for additional detention beds and more border patrol agents and port of entry officers. Those are long-standing Republican priorities, priorities that are shared by many Democrats as well. As the ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense, I want to take a few moments to highlight the bill in this package on which Chair Tester and I worked extremely closely. The bill avoids a devastating year-long CR that every single service chief told us would be a disaster for the Department of Defense. It meets the complex threats that are facing our country. Madam President, to say that things have changed since the fiscal year 2024 budget request was first presented last spring would be a drastic understatement. Putin refuses to end his war in Ukraine. Hamas conducted its heinous, brutal attack on Israel on October 7. Iran continues to fan the flame of violence and terrorism throughout the Middle East, including against American forces. And China's military budget and armed forces continue to grow unabated. But you don't have to take my word for it. In the past few weeks, the commander of U.S. Central Command, General Eric Corella, has described this as the most dangerous security environment in 50 years. On the other side of the world, the commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command told Chairman Tester and me earlier this week that this is the most dangerous time that he has seen in his 40-year career, citing cooperation between Russia and China as a key and growing concern. In addition, just last week, the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Chief of Naval Operations wrote to the majority and minority leaders describing the harm to the readiness of our Navy and Marine Corps unless we quickly pass a full-year defense appropriations bill. This needs to be done before a large part, about two-thirds of our government, would otherwise shut down at midnight tonight. We must not let that occur. To meet these challenges, our bill includes nearly $824.5 billion for the United States military. It fully funds the 5.2% pay raise for service members, the largest pay raise in more than 20 years. And it includes a critical $123 million increase for bonuses for our new recruits 
and junior enlisted soldiers. The bill also doubles the number of children who will have access to full-day pre-kindergarten in DOD schools, an important priority for Senator Murray and for me. I also want to salute the work that Senator Ken, that Representative Ken Calvert did in this whole area of improving benefits and pay for our junior enlisted soldiers. Madam President, as the Chinese Navy rapidly expands to more than 400 ships over the next two years, our legislation includes $33.7 billion for Navy shipbuilding and down payments for both an additional DDG-51 destroyer and an amphibious ship, the largest shipbuilding budget ever provided. Indeed, our legislation supports a Navy fleet that is six ships larger than the President's woefully inadequate request. The defense bill also includes more than $2.2 billion for our uniformed military leaders' highest priorities that were not included in the administration's request. But as you know, Madam President, we get a list of unfunded priorities from our service chiefs. Our bill includes $273 million for long-range radars and sensors to close the awareness gaps identified by General Van Herc when he was commander of Northern Command. It includes $50 million for the Indo-PACOM commander to accelerate his top priority targeting capability and $200 million to accelerate the development of the E-7 radar aircraft that was a top priority for the Air Force. To strengthen deterrence against China, our legislation keeps the modernization of the nuclear triad on track. It funds the transition from just in time to a just in case stockpile of munitions by authorizing and funding for the first time ever six multi-year procurement contracts for missiles and munitions. Surely that has been one of the lessons that we have learned from Ukraine, how important it is that we have modernized and adequate stockpiles. $6.5 billion is also included to maximize this year's production of Patriot air defense missiles, long-range anti-ship missiles, and six other long-range precision strike missile programs. But finally, in the area of defense, this bill also includes $500 million for Iron Dome and David Sling and Arrow, the cooperative missile defense programs that are consistent with the 10-year memorandum of understanding signed between the United States and our close ally, Israel. This will provide much needed assistance to Israel in its fight against terrorism. Madam President, in addition to having a strong national defense, another priority of mine is biomedical research. And this bill will continue the progress that we are making in increasing funding for the National Institutes of Health. It increases funding for NIH by 300 million, including 120 million in an in increase for the National Cancer Institute and 100 million more for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia research. I would note that it also increases funding for mental health 
which is so important, an area that has been neglected somewhat in the past. Another cause of mine is the co-chair with Senator Jean Shaheen of the Diabetes Caucus has been to increase the funding for diabetes research, and we have done so in this bill. We also pay attention to the problems with opioids and have included an increase in the funding for the Help to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, known as the HEAL Initiative. Palliative care research also receives an increase. That is so important as our population ages and that is an area, long-term care, that we still need to do an awful lot of work on in this country. I hope that this will start us on our path to, to that end. Again, Madam President, there has been so much work done on this package of bills, and I want to thank my Republican and Democratic colleagues on the Appropriations Committee, the leaders in the House as well on the Appropriations Subcommittees and Full Committee, and I also want to thank our Senate leaders on both sides of the aisle and our House leaders for their extensive work on these bills. Members throughout the Senate have contributed to prioritizing funding and identifying how funding should be prioritized. And I want to note for my Republican colleagues that the legacy riders that we have traditionally included, such as the Hyde Amendment, are included in this bill. Finally, I want to thank our extraordinary staff. They have worked nonstop throughout this past year, but particularly this past month, without getting sleep, without seeing their families, just working night and day. I urge my colleagues to join me in voting for this final FY 2024 appropriations package and complete our fundamental job of funding our government. Thank you, Madam President.